Evening, good afternoon, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Beer Boot Camp Sessions. My name is Julian, and currently with me we have Justin Hawk from Moor Beer. Justin is the head brewer as well as the owner, and was voted by the um, the Beer um, Guild Writers Association as the Brewer of the Year in 2017. Justin, welcome to Beer Boot Camp Sessions. Cheers, everyone. Thanks a lot for having me. Hope everyone's got a beer. Yep, got a beer here. Got ready to go. Cheers. Everything's good. Um, so, first of all, welcome to the show. Uh, this is our uh, seventh, one, two, three, four, five, seventh in a series that we've been running for the last two, three weeks whilst we've been under lockdown. Um, and this is pretty much a thing around the world. Now, we obviously host the conference once a year with... Uh, uh, six or seven international speakers. I know Wendy did invite you to come this year. You had a backup. It became a problem. But now we've got an even bigger problem. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about Moor Beer and how you got involved and where you started. Great. So uh, unfortunately, I've not been to South Africa before and we haven't really exported much of any beer down there. So I'm not sure how familiar people are with us. I know we do get a lot of travelers over to to visit us in England and we do sell our beer in a lot of other countries in the world. Uh, I was really looking forward to going down in August, but uh, but as was mentioned, I had a back operation, so that kind of was gonna kill it anyway for this year. But, and then we've got this whole mess that's going on around there. So I just wanna give everyone a few minutes back around into uh, myself and also the brewery, so you know what we're kind of talking about. Uh, it be interesting to see just kind of a virtual show of hands later who might've heard of us or had our beer before. Uh, so basically, I started drinking beer when I was about five years old. My dad, <laughs> he said to me, he said, well, one of these days, you're going to be drinking beer, so you may as well learn what good beer tastes like. And I was at my uncle's house, and it was, uh, it was a Polaner Dunkel, so a uh, dark lager. Obviously, I'm talking to brewers, so I'll try to keep it uh, at a professional level. Um, and I really like the taste. I think something dark and a little bit malty and sweet was the right thing at the time to sort of get introduced to. And he used to really, this was kind of Los Angeles in the late seven, mid, well, mid to late 70s. And uh, there wasn't a lot of beer avail available then that was considered craft. We had, of course, Fritz Maytag from Anchor. He had restarted uh, Anchor, which is really the, the sort of godfather of the craft beer movement and someone I got a lot of time and respect for. Um, so you can get Anchor, you could get Sierra. In fact, at the time, I don't even think you can get Sierra Nevada. I think it was too young for that. Um, Sierra started about 79, 80. So I remember when Sierra started and my dad would go around the bottle shops and there was like little bits of yeast on the bottom of the bottle. And he's like, oh, I don't know what that is, if it's good for you or not. So we used to get a lot of imported beers, a lot of beers from, from Britain and Germany and Belgium, pretty much is what you could get. And every time he cracked something, he just give me a taste and I really got a taste for it. Uh, he was coming over to the UK a lot for work. And when I was 13, it was they had to go over uh, during my birthday time. And rather than leave me at home, they took me with them, which was great. So I got pissed for the first time at a pub at 13 on uh, Samuel Smith's uh, Museum Ale, which they, don't, uh, which they don't make anymore, although Samuel Smith still exists as a brewery. Uh, they got some great pubs to go visit if you're ever in the UK, some really traditional ones. They have some very weird business practices, so might not be quite as keen on that side of it, but uh, but they're great pubs to go to. So that's how I kind of started drinking. And then I wound up uh, going to uh, university in West Point, which is the military academy. And that gave me a great sort of grounding in not only discipline, but also strict attention to detail. And uh, obviously a lot of hard work and grafting, which are required in brewing. But the other thing that was really cool about that was one of my tech officers was a home brewer. And at one point we got to try his home brew and that totally blew my mind, not only in the fact it was great, but actually you could make beer at home, which I thought was really, really cool. Cause prior to that, I thought beer had just sort of been descended from the heavens and just granted to humanity. Uh, I'm not religious at all, but <laughs> I realized how it was made. And so that kind of got me an interest in it. I got stationed in Germany. And of course, was loving drinking all the great German beer there and driving over to Belgium and the Czech Republic and everywhere I could go to just basically research and drink and drink and drink and just try and stay fit as well. Uh, that really being in Germany gave me 
part of the philosophy of what more beer is based on. So we've got a philosophy that comes from three great, what I would call brewing heritage heritages and make our beer kind of a bit unique in the market. So the first part was from Germany and it's what the Germans call Naturtrube or it's sort of uh, unfiltered beer with naturally hazy with yeast in it. And I found, I didn't know that beer was supposed to be clear, supposed to be hazy, whatever. It was just the way it was. And the beers that were brewed that were not true, true were not only a lot more flavorful, they had better mouthfeel. And the next day you didn't have a hangover, even if you drank like five liters of it. So that was great. And that really formed a core or forms a core part of what we do. So all of our beer is, is completely unfiltered, unpasteurized. And we intentionally leave yeast in the beer because I think it adds to the, to the character of the beer in very measured doses, I should also say. So we don't like soup. Um, I'm actually not a real fan of the whole New England thing that's gone on. That, that to me is kind of taken it to an extreme, but within, within balance, I think yeast is a great part of the character of the beer. So that's one key part of it, and that came from being in Germany. And then when I left the Army, uh, moved back to California for a couple of years and was living in San Francisco. Was, this was in the mid-90s. This was during the kind of the craft beer boom that was going on there, and everyone was starting to brew IPAs and really hoppy beers. So I got a taste for IPA, which I'm drinking our IPA hoppiness at the minute. So this is uh, tasting very good. So it, it's, you, know, you can't see really on the camera, but it is, you know, it is hazy, so you can't see my finger very well through it. Uh, we have a measured amount of, uh, of yeast that we've got in here. We can condition all of our beer, which is something I'll talk about in a second. Uh, we're the first to be recognized by the Campaign for Real Ale to do 100% can conditioning. And, uh, you know, it's part of what makes us our beer that, but this is our IPA, so it's nicely uh, nicely hoppy, and that came from learning to do the home brewing and uh, going on the sort of craft, modern craft beer journey when I was living in San Francisco. Hmm. But the third part of it was going back to England, which is I always had this fascination for British pubs and real ale, partly from my dad, but also just I really enjoyed it. And when I was home brewing, I used to brew a lot of best bitters, um, even brewed a mild. I was just really interested in that style. So when I had an opportunity, I got the company I was working for to, to move me over to, uh, to England and wanted to really immerse myself in pubs and the drinking culture here, always with the intention of having my brewery here in England as opposed to in the States. And that's ultimately what I did. So the third, we took the, the German Cardin Natratrube element of that part of my history, the, the hoppy kind of craft beer thing from San Francisco, and then British real ale and re-fermentation for me is absolutely essential to everything that we do in our brewing. Even our lagers, we do a proper sort of German lagering. Uh, we don't force carbon in any of our beer. We do naturally, you know, conditioned and we, uh, those happen to be tank conditioned as opposed to can conditioned. But, you know, we, we, we are huge proponents of those three sort of pillars and that's what makes more beer what it was or what it is. Uh, we've been going for, 13 years. There was a more beer that existed before I had it. It was started by a dairy farmer in the ass end of Somerset. So if you've ever heard of the Glastonbury Festival, it's about kind of 10 miles from where that is. On an old dairy farm, it was, uh, there was something called the milk orders that came in in the kind of the mid nineties in England, where it really just reduced the price of milk and made a lot of, of dairy farmers unviable. So he was looking at what he was going to do and decided he liked going to the pub and getting pissed. So he turned some of his dairy equipment into brewing equipment and started out uh, brewing that way. And unfortunately, he wasn't a brewer. And sometimes he would brew some great beer. Just, we've all done this. Sometimes you brew some great beer. Sometimes you brew some that aren't so good. And unfortunately, more often than not, his beer was rumored to be inconsistent and, and he had some other business problems. So he had started a brewery in 96. He shut it in 2005. Um, I heard about it. He was looking to either sell it or, or partner with someone. So uh, basically, I quit my job and moved down to, to Somerset and restarted the brewery in uh, the beginning of 2007 on old dairy equipment with two giant gas burners underneath a rectangular like dairy tank. So this was literally scaled up homebrew. Uh, we had, it was a uh, 16 hectoliter 
three length at the time uh, or 10 kind of UK barrel. So we had two fermentation vessels, literally did everything. It was basically kind of a, a lifestyle business, I would call it. I didn't initially start it to be a proper kind of brewing, you know, brewing business. It was all about just really scaled up home brewing and because I just wanted to be doing that. Uh, ultimately, the brewery became uh, a bit more famous for some of the beers we were doing. So back then, craft beer as a term didn't really exist. No one over here was brewing beers that were hazy and unfined. No one was brewing hoppy beers and certainly no one was charging the prices we were charging for beer because we were costing it appropriately. So the first few years were very, very hard, um, but we did get a reputation and we earned a lot of awards that kind of built things out. And then we kind of scaled up from there. Uh, we moved out of Somerset in 2015. 14, 2014, I think it was, to the center of Bristol, which is the nearest uh, town or near, the nearest city to where Somerset is. It's a fantastic city with a great, uh, great food and drink culture. It's really independent. Um, it's just a great buzz to be there. So we moved and we were in the middle. We were literally like working in a, in a dairy farm. Uh, so we basically moved into the center of Bristol, moved the brewery up there and have been expanding ever since. We don't brew on dairy equipment anymore, so we, <laughs> we've got proper brewing equipment. Uh, our brew length now is 20 UK barrel or about 33 hectoliter. Our annual production last year was about 6,000 hectoliter. Uh, we've got capacity to do about twice that now. So we've got uh, extra tank space that we were growing into very, very nicely. Uh, and we were gonna be pretty much maxing it out this year. But of course, we've got this wonderful pandemic that's uh, that's altering those plans. Uh, but we do everything in house. So one thing, I'm a bit of a control freak, like I'm sure many of you are. Uh, we have everything from our in-house in, in house lab. So we do all of our own lab work. We do send stuff out to get independently checked. But we do all of our micro, all of our growing up of our yeast. Uh, we have a yeast propagation um, facility. Uh, to uh, to yeast pranks or you know propagators that we do. Uh, we have our own canning line, so we rather than get a kind of we got into canning probably at the kind of the bleeding. We we're usually on the bleeding edge of things, so we got into it pretty early on. And instead of going with what I saw my peers were going with, were the kind of the the more entry level uh, North American lines that were popular at the time. Uh, I wasn't really happy with that approach because I saw the problems that they were having with them. So I went over to Germany and specced a, uh, as within as much as we could reasonably try and uh, get a get a bit of funding for uh, a nice high-end German canning line. So we don't have a Cronus that uh, you know that does millions of cans an hour, but we got a fantastic system that's built by a company called uh, Leibinger. Uh, it's a rotary filler, nine head filler, does about 2,500 cans an hour at 330 mil. And we started out, uh, like with everything else we do, I insisted that it was going to be naturally conditioned, which in a can is pretty risky uh, proposition because cans are not necessarily as robust as casts or kegs or, or bottles. So we had to make sure that we're spot on with everything. Uh, to do that, we do attenuation limit tests on every single batch of beer to make sure that we know the beer is absolutely finished uh, when we're going to get it ready for packaging. And then we get the, the cell counts down to what we want them to be for that style. So if we're brewing a wheat beer, of course, we'll have a higher cell count going into it. Um, the lagers, we, we bring down very, very low. Um, most of the beers that we brew are ales. We've got about 10 core beers in our portfolio, which is a very large core range to be keeping in stock and a logistical nightmare. Uh, but usually those were packaging at around uh, half a million cells. And we will then adjust the, uh, well, we can't bring, we have no way of getting the cell count down other than time and uh, gravity and temperature. So we don't use a centrifuge or anything like that. We don't do any filtration. We make sure that we've got enough viable yeast to, uh, to do the re-fermentation that we want. And then we bring the sugar levels back up into the beer. 
basically by priming uh, the tanks prior to packaging. And again, depending on the beer style, so we'll go a little bit lighter on some of the ales and maybe a little bit heavier on some of the wheat beers and things like that. Uh, what else was I gonna tell you guys about? I think uh, we've always, we have always been on the bleeding edge of, of things here in the UK, which has been a painful way to exist. And I know that as a kind of an emerging, uh, especially in an environment that's so traditional in South Africa, I know that the, the craft beer movement was uh, further behind places like you know, California and whatnot. So you've got a lot of great learnings that you can take and, and adapt really, really quickly from other countries and, and what they've done. Uh, and the market, you'll have a completely different set of market challenges to, to what I've got here and different barriers to entry. So here we've got a lot of tide houses. It's hard to find uh, routes to market that aren't sewn up in some way by either a, a big player or a big pub company. Uh, we do sell from, a, if you look at our product mix, we sell about 40% uh, in, well, now it's about 100% in, in small pack, but we were running about 30 to 40% in small pack, um, I mean cans, and the rest was in draft beer, which was a mix of cask and keg. When we started out, we were only doing cask, so we were 100% cask ale brewery. There was a lot of demand for our beer, and at the time there weren't really keg lines in the UK, but we had a lot of international demand, which was, which was pretty interesting. So we started out hand bottling to fulfill some of that. And we also start out doing kegs. And at the time, this whole, you know, key keg didn't exist. There were no systems for sending, uh, you know, steels really around. And there's just no infrastructure for it. So I was approached years and years and years, this is probably like 11 years ago by a company that was starting up. It was actually based out of Australia. Uh, it was called Eco Keg. And they were, as far as I'm aware, so one of the very early entrants to one-way kegs. They were really over-engineered. They're fantastic, robust things. Um, massive black, like, uh, it looks exactly like a 50-liter keg. And that's what it was designed to do, is run down a, a kegging line. But they're basically massive black outer um, to block any UV coming in, but also to be incredibly robust. I mean, you could throw those things like six stories off a building and they'd be fine. Uh, and they would also handle pressures really well. And then on the inside, they basically had effectively like a, like an egg with an oxygen scavenger in it. So and they had an S-type spear in them, really super well engineered. But the problem we had at the time when we first started wanting to use them is we had no way of filling them. So we don't have a kegging line. Everything we were doing, we were a cask ale brewery. We were brewing out of dairy tanks. So there's no way of pressurizing a tank. There's no way of pushing anything. Um, I didn't want to pump anything because I thought that that was too rough on the beer. So I basically had to get special dispensation from them to actually open their kegs up. Uh, so we basically get them in, we degas them, we'd, we'd take the, the spear out, we'd fill them by hand, we'd re-ferment everything in them and we send them around the world. And that's, that works really, really well. We switched a few years ago from eco kegs to key kegs because the customer demand was just insane. We had a lot of, um, I love eco keg, I love the people who we worked with in the company as a product that worked really, really well for us, it was super robust. Um, but the challenge that we had with them was they were over engineers, a lot of plastic a lot to dispose of. If you think you have problems with key kegs now, trying to get rid of them, these eco kegs, if you can imagine, they're all basically like a 50 liter keg. And landlords, they just didn't know what to do. They were stacking up. And also everyone was tying up lines with key keg couplers. And these had S-type couplers in them. So it was a bit more of a problem. So ultimately we changed over. And I got to say that uh, I do appreciate the fact that key kegs have the bag inside and that it keeps the beer ostensibly fresher for longer uh, means you can take beers on and off a lot easier. The S types, um, they were great for if you wanted to sort of bleed some pressure off, they're a lot easier to do it than a key keg is. Uh, or if you wanted to, which isn't something we would want to, but if people had a, a a beer that had perhaps hadn't carbonated up well, they could force carbonate in the keg because it could take the pressure where a key keg couldn't. Um, so that's one of the things that we started working with 
like I say, about 11 years before there was really a market in, in these things. Uh, and then talk to you about the uh, the cans and how we've kind of done that. I'm um, trying to think some of the other things. Uh, one thing that is really central to what we do, and I said we really have been on the, the bleeding edge of, is this whole concept of natural true or in the UK, I turned, I created this stupid term that I wish I never did called unfined. So in the UK, the way it works with, uh, with cask beer traditionally, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the way it works with, uh, uh, cask beer traditionally is that you would Referment it. Uh, yeah, there, that's our don't drink fish, Luke. <laughs> uh, we would uh, you referment in the cask, uh, you leave enough yeast and sugar the way that you would with anything else. Cask beer, however, is carbonated to a much lower level than you would normally expect to see in kegs or in bottles or in cans. That created a problem for us because we carbonate and package everything at exactly the same time in exactly the same way. So if you're getting our best bitter, for example, or our IPA, if you have it on cask, if you have it in keg, if you have it in can, the beer is thousand percent identical. So we package it exactly the same time. We just literally fill however many cans we need out of that batch. And then we move the, you know, the hose and, and add a racking arm to it. And we fill kegs or we fill casks. And that has meant that our casks are at the higher end of carbonation for what, and make, sometimes more difficult for traditional publicans to sell her uh, than a lot of our peers are. So if you go to a lot of the, the kind of the regional brewers uh, who, are, who are great friends of mine and I have a lot of respect for their beer, but their beer will be carbonated to a much lower level and a lot easier to handle in the cellar. And the other thing that is traditional with Cascale is they would use finings. So finings are, uh, made of the uh, they're called isinglass it looks absolutely disgusting the definition is something like the acidified aqueous solution of collagen derived from the swim bladder of certain tropical fish with the addition of sulfur dioxide if i remember right it's about the the verbatim uh, description of what findings are it looks and smells absolutely foul so I basically decided I wasn't going to put that in our beer. It wasn't something I wanted to work with. All it does is create uh, larger clumps of yeast and fish guts. And because we live here on Earth and there's gravity still, uh, it just basically pulls them down to the bottom of the cask quicker. So ultimately, as you know, if you keep yeast in a beer, generally over some period of time, especially with, uh, with colder temperatures, it will settle out to the bottom. Depending on the strain of yeast, it might be a bit fluffy and rise back up, or it might stick really hard like glue to the bottom. But we, uh, you know, it's not something that that we wanted to do. So I had to create an entirely new market in the UK that didn't exist because people would not drink a beer that was not absolutely crystal clear. So what you basically do is you'd walk into a pub and you'd see people, and they would literally they'd hold up their glass. And they put two fingers behind it, and if they couldn't see everything absolutely a thousand percent crystal clear through it, they just refused to drink uh, the beer. And for us, it was a massive, massive problem. So I had to create this whole new market, which stupidly I called it unfined because we didn't use the findings. It took a lot of years for it to really take hold, and it was a campaign that I had to run on several fronts. So I understand you guys are working at the minute to lobby the government uh, against a lot of the restrictions that are in place. You know, these are the types of things that, you know, have worked with the government on various initiatives. I've worked also with, uh, with industry bodies and with consumers to try and get things changed. And one of the messages that I wanted to get across in this talk was that if you got something and you feel passionate about it and it's the right thing, then you can, you can make that change and you can make that difference. Uh, so, for example, what we've done with Unfined Beer, there's no, there is a market now out there uh, that serves... Well, it serves the vegan community, although we didn't design it for that specifically. Um, but it cr it creates an opportunity for people to have beer in a way that that I felt was important. That we wanted to express our beer, but is also a lot more natural uh, and gives people who are, who are perhaps averse to having something with with fish in it, give them an opportunity to drink it. And now we've got more. Uh, 
I'd say more of the breweries than not probably have their beer unfined. Many of them use that term on their beer. It's become sort of a, a ubiquitous term now. Uh, I hate the word. I wish I would have come up with a different word to get it through because we were so far ahead of the, of the time. I had to work with the, the Brewers Association, which is SEBA. So I had to basically lobby them to accept unfined hazy beer in their competitions. Uh, it was not easy. Uh, you had someone who was young at the time with an American accent, charging a lot of money for beer, brewing with American hops that the traditional brewers were very much opposed to, uh, and trying to sell them hazy, expensive beer. And they just did not want to have it. But I basically created a campaign. I had uh, a co-sponsor who worked with me, Eddie Gad from Ramsgate Brewery, fantastic brewer. He finds his beer. He's an amazing brewer, but he really believed in what I was saying that I should have the right to express the beer in that way. So he worked with me to get these things pushed through the Brewers Association. Um, it was a real challenge. We did get laughed at a lot, uh, but eventually it took hold. And now actually all the beers that are winning or most of the beers that are winning the awards and gaining the market traction are the hazy beers, uh, the beers that are unfined. And as a consumer movement, again, it's given the vegan community and those who don't wanna have fish products in their, in their beer uh, an opportunity to have stuff like that. So I think that's a great success story, something I'm really proud of. I wish I'd have used a different name. Uh, we call it live beer now. <laughs> and we say our beer is all naturally conditioned or live beer. Uh, we'll still use the word unfined and occasionally, but we got that cool logo that uh, the Julian was holding up a second ago that, uh, that a fan of ours put together for us. So that was really cool. So you can really make a difference on some of these things. Uh, cake conditioning was another thing that we did. P people would just not accept, you know, yeast in there. We're like, okay, well, we are re-fermenting. This is real ale. This is this is exactly what you're having in a cask, but this is just in a keg. It's just a different format. It's just a different dispense mechanism. And in the UK, where there was a real hatred between the cask drinking community and those who drank sort of keg fizzy lager, they, one would not communicate with the other. So I had to basically, I wanted to sell beer to both of them because I enjoyed, you know, proper lager and I enjoyed uh, real ale. So it was a real challenge to get the two working. Uh, I'm a camera member, so the campaign for real ale, uh, just, just personally, we win a lot of uh, awards and get a lot of recognition from them, but equally a lot of them are uh, a little bit biased against the fact that we do have unfined beer and that we do uh, charge the prices that you need to charge if you're using a lot of American hops and, and things like that. So that, that's also been a challenge, but we've done really well with that. We've gone different routes to market. So the export market was where we went first with it because there was really no place to sell keg beer here in the UK, you know, years and years ago. But we did persevere and we fought and we won that. Uh, same thing with can conditioning. So if you look at the, you know, if you get any of our cans, they will have live yeast still in them. You can culture it up and you can brew with it if you want to. But it took me over a year, nearly a year and a half to get camera to accept that our beer was can conditioned and could therefore be classed as real ale. It was absolutely about, ridiculous. Uh, yeah, speaking about camera, I've just got a question from uh, one of the, the viewers at the moment. Um, how active is camera at the moment? Is it still very active? Camera is active. It had a, uh, they, they had a massive sort of review of what they were all about about a year or so ago, and it was kind of inconclusive. So what you have at the minute, and I, and I love camera. I volunteered a lot, worked in a lot of festivals uh, prior to having the brewery. Uh, like I say, I, I'm a camera member and I do love going to traditional real ale pubs. So I got a lot of sympathy for it. But as an organization, it doesn't do itself a lot of favors a lot of times because it is so blinkered and biased and into to being very religious about real ale and what that means. But it's not relevant to the modern world per se. And they're completely unwilling. Uh, some, sorry, some people within the organization are completely unwilling to open up or consider any changes. 
At the same time, you've got a, a lot of younger people, a lot of more open-minded people, people who've traveled a lot, who want it to be more about good beer than about a dispense method. So those are, if there's a lot of soul searching going on with camera and I've still got a lot of time for the organization. Uh, they're still the largest consumer group that exists, but uh, yeah, they, they need to kind of get into the, the 21st century a bit more, which they're, which to be fair, they are trying to do, but there's still some factions within it that are, are making the change slower. Very, very cool. Now tell me um, the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Thank you. Uh, huh. Just another beer. Um, first of all, the background that I see here, this is obviously your, your vaults. Um, are you still doing uh, barrel aged beer? Was the one question. The other one is your Lambic Zune shirt. Did you yeah. actually go to Milan? Did you make any Lambic style beers? And then another one quickly um, is it a hectic process to get the real ale label or is it kind of like straight stand forward on that as well? Okay, so three questions. So first question is uh, about the vaults, which I completely forgot to mention. So we, um, we, I always do things because I'm passionate about it. In the end, I know somehow it'll come good. I'm not stupid and I do put business plans together, but we are very much a product driven company. And as a result, we have intentionally grown a lot slower and more organically than, than a lot of our uh, peers. We're, we have absolutely no investment or funding or anything like that. It's literally we're self-built and every time we make any profit we just reinvest and grow. So that's how we've always built the company. Um, it's meant we've grown a lot slower but, uh, but we've done it ethically and we've done it in our way and it means when we're in a crisis like this right now we're in a much better position to be able to call the shots uh, and to survive it. So one of the things that I did is we were having a real hard time accessing the London market because it's just it was just too far to deliver from Bristol to London. It's kind of like a well two hour drive to the outskirts of London, but then you're talking about hours of driving in like gridlock. So and the distributors that service the London market um, to some extent were either not that interested in us or they're just too disparate to, to really get any penetration, but we did have demand there. So we thought what we would do is we would put a satellite hub in London for distribution. And then off the back of that, we thought, okay, well, well, if we're doing that, we may as well run it as a tap room, like, you know, a few hours a week or something. And it just so happens we found a great place on the Bermondsey Beer Mile, which is, uh, which is a fantastic place. I recommend that everyone goes to visit. So it's, it's longer than a mile now, but I, I can't even tell you how many breweries are down there. I think it's gotta be probably like 30 breweries in London just exists and you can like literally walk from one to the next. Um, so we happened to find this amazing arch that was available and we use it for three purposes. One is uh, as, as a, a distribution hub for servicing London, uh, one for the, the tap room, which we call the vault. And we call it the vault because the third thing is about barrel aging. So I started barrel aging back in 2009, again, long before it was trendy and popular. We had uh, our, our probably our most famous beer is a beer called Old Freddie Walker. It's uh, it's a strong dark old ale. It's amazing. It's um, it wins loads and, and loads of awards. It's been champion winner beer of Britain a couple of times. It basically tastes like liquid fruitcake or liquid Christmas pudding. That's something that we we um, eat here in, in England. It's really good and. Uh, what you do when you're eating Christmas pudding is you put brandy butter on top of it. And when we were still back in Somerset, we had a, a cider brandy distillery that was located just four miles away. So I had this great idea one day. I said, I'm gonna barrel age some of our old Freddie Walker because I wanna get the brandy flavors in to, to mix with the fruitcake flavors. And this is back in 2009. And so I went down to the distillery and uh, the guy who owns it, uh, also named Julian, <laughs> He's, he's very, very eccentric, and he didn't know me from, from Adam, and I walked up there, I'm like, hey, I've got more beer, we're just down the road, we've got this great beer, we think it'll work well in your barrels, can I get a couple of barrels from you? And he said, absolutely not, no barrels, he said, grain and fruit should never mix. And he basically just turned around and walked away from me, so I was scratching my head, because that's not the response that I was expecting. So I went back to... Uh, 
went back to lick my wounds and a, and a couple of months later I went back and like hey Julian you know I'd stop by the other day or a couple of months ago and I really think this is a great idea we can get the two brands together and you know the beer is going to taste amazing here why don't you try the beer and he he had I didn't realize he'd been robbed that day but he basically just like launched this tirade of abuse at me including starting the Vietnam War which I don't know how that was relevant to anything um he didn't even know I went to West Point <laughs> so I was like uh that was a little strange and as I was walking away he said okay I just we just been robbed so you know just go away you came at a bad time so the third time I went there he said okay just stop coming two barrels you can have two barrels that's fine so we did it and that was that beer is called fusion we still make it um it's a fantastic beer it got the marriage of flavors that we were looking for uh, and we started this barrel aging experiment which was just like a kind of a once a year thing but we had no space for still want to do more barrel aging as I took the most expensive real estate you could find in all of Britain which is in London and I put a warehouse there and I do barrel aging in London so it's pretty much stupidest thing you could do financially uh, but it kind of works for us so we use most of the space uh, that's in the vault is in the back is designed for for barrel aging and we're slowly adding and filling it out uh, what we do is we brew the beer in Bristol we put it into when it's done doing primary fermentation. Uh, these are, I should preface this by saying to date, all but one of the beers that we've done for barrel aging have been clean spirit barrel beers, because that's what I want to have so far wanted to do, although that will come onto the Lambic Zone and Lambic question in a second. Um, so we basically brew the beer, we put it into a thousand liter, effectively large bag and box from a uh, a supplier called Arlington Containers. So if you want to move liquid around, I think it's a fantastic supplier to go and look at. They're basically like IBCs, but they're bag and box. So they're single use. Um, you got no oxygen in them. They're totally sterile. They're, they work really, really well. And at the end, the actual container collapses down into basically like a pallet size. So we use them and we just ship uh, a thousand liters of, of well finished beer down to London and then we then put that into barrels we leave it for as long as we think the beer needs which is usually around six months or so uh, and then we do the reverse we we ship it right back to Bristol and we package it so it's the stupidest business decision you could ever do so we're producing liquid in Bristol shipping it to London aging it at store at high storage cost and shipping it back to Bristol for packaging and then it's got to re-ferment for another four weeks because these beers are usually pretty strong but we do a nice range of, uh, of beers doing barrel aging for that at the minute um, so that's what we're doing with the vault so if you want to go down to the vault we're open seven days a week when of course we can all travel and drink again uh, and you can go down there we do have a focus on cast beers you you can see go to the bar that's what it'll look like because of course we love cask so we usually have um, about half a dozen casks on we've got 12 keg taps of our of our own beers on there and then we also have sour beers that we uh several sour beer taps that we run so going back to the next question about sour beer production and lambic zone and whatnot so one of my passions in in traveling i mentioned i used to go to belgium a lot when i lived in germany back in the 90s no one wanted Lambeck back then. I'll that. I like sour beer. Um, I would drive over there. I would buy lots of sour. A lot of the sour beer that I had would be worth a bloody fortune now. But I was paying like, you know, these are Belgian francs back then. I forgot how many, but the equivalent of like probably like two euros a bottle for like a 750 bottle of beer that must sell for thousands now. Um, and I would just drink them. I mean, just. And that's what it's, beer is designed to drink, right? We're, this is not about creating an, a, a false account of rare things. That's not, and, and the, the Lambic producing that. So don't, don't do that. <laughs> drink beer, enjoy it, share it with your friends. And that's what I used to do with some, some very, what, what are now considered very rare and trendy things. Uh, I've always had a passion for it. And consequently, a lot of the traveling and work that I do, I became really good friends with, uh, with a lot of Lambic producers. Uh, so, uh, for example, Jean at Cantillon, you know, really good, good friends, and we do a lot to uh, to try and support uh, sour beer. Uh, so going, it's a little bit mixed together about the lambic and lambic zone and lambic production backstory. But 
Uh, for those who don't know, Lambic Zone is what is a phenomenal bar that's in uh, that's in Milan. It's uh, owned and run by uh, by Nino. Uh, there's a few partners that so it's basically Nino. If you go in there, you'll see Nino and Sara, who's his partner, and the two of them run it um, along with a great team. Uh, one of the other uh, co-owners of the bar is uh, someone who's basically my brother. Uh, his name is uh, Alessandro Belle, and he's from Aragon Pub, or you might know him from Aragon Sour Festival if you've ever traveled to that. Um, I love him so much that I've actually got it tattooed inside my arm. <laughs> and we do, we've done some amazing things in, in life together. So yeah, I've been to Lambic Zone uh, more than once. Uh, and one of the things that Ale does, and Nino and Sara and, and, and the rest of the Sour family, is they run something called the Aragon Sour Festival. It's basically uh, in a city called uh, Reggio Emilia. It would be run that last weekend in May, first weekend in June every year. Uh, it's the best festival in the world. It's in an old um, convent, and basically uh, you just have a hundred taps of sour beer constantly rotating and bottles and workshops and producers and amazing people and weather and a real focus on uh, on local fantastic food and artisanal products. Uh, it's, the, it's the best weekend you can kind of like ever spend in your life. So unfortunately it's not happening this year. They We have taken a satellite. Uh, last year we did a kind of satellite edition in Bristol, which was, uh, which was, a real honor to be able to do and to bring all these great beers out to the UK. Uh, and then they were going to do a uh, China edition uh, in Shanghai this year as well. Uh, although I suspect like all of the things that's probably unfortunately put on hold at the minute. So yes, I've got a huge passion for, for Lambic, um, Lambic and sour beer. Uh, this, if you want to go to the amazing places in the world, go to Milan, go to Lambic zone, go to arrogant pub in, uh, in Reggio Emilia. Uh, you will, the Italian sour beer producers are absolutely amongst some of the best in the world right now. Uh, there's names I could put out there. I mean, uh, Ricardo Montagioco, he's one of the, the oldest one. He's, he's not only a wonderful person, but he makes amazing sour beer and amazing salami and also forages for, uh, for truffles and things like that. He's an awesome guy. Uh, one of the, the younger ones that's getting a lot of attention, rightfully so right now, is, uh, is one called Cadel Brado, which is uh, outside of Bologna. They're phenomenal. Uh, you got Upper Bacco is a small one that's, um, that they're making some amazing sour beers. Perificio uh, Italiano is one of the oldest microbreweries in, uh, in Italy, best known for their beer called Tipo Pills, but they have a side project called Clan Barico, which is all about wild and sour beers. And if you think about the access to fantastic wine barrels that they have there, it makes sense uh, with their passion for food and balancing out acidity with, you know, with salt and fat. Uh, it makes sense as to why they're becoming so good at those types of things. So uh, also, of course, one of my favorites is Lover Beer. Uh, also one of the oldest sour beer producers in, in Italy. Uh, Walter is he's just an amazing guy. So I've done a collaboration with, uh, with Walter. We made a uh, sour beer called San Biki, which was a three-way collaboration between uh, Walter, Walter Lover. We brewed it in Lover beer, uh, myself and Mike Murphy. Uh, uh, Mike's um, obviously from Lervig up in, uh, up in Norway, uh, a fellow American expat and a great guy and great brewer. So that's the first sour beer I've done that's been kind of commercially produced as it were. I have done uh, when it was uh, John Benoit's uh, 50th birthday. I went out to brew with him a few years ago and we made a historical uh, Lambic, which is, he, he said he wanted to age it for four years or so. So that's not gonna be out for a while. It, it won't have any more name on it or whatever, but we did the brew day together, which was a fantastic time to spend together. Uh, and we have, we will be doing our own sour program in the vault when we can, I'll get back to some level of normality, but they will all be traditional sour beers. They will all be done with time. We won't, we won't be doing Berliner Weiss or Goza. I know they're super trendy and popular. We can make a lot of money doing them right now, but they're not what I personally enjoy. So we won't go down that route, but we will have some sour beer coming. 
Have you, um, it says you've obviously been to Catalonia. Have you thought about doing uh, some, uh, what they call uh, collabs with the guys in Spain as well at the same time? Yeah, so uh, it's another, there's several regions that I really love going to in the world. Italy, I spend, I mean, prior to the lockdown and my back surgery, uh, pretty much we go to Italy nearly every month. I've done collabs with a lot of Italian brewers and, and they're basically like, like family. Um, even though I don't speak Italian, but it's all right. It's my partner. She's learning. She can speak. <laughs> yes, but <laughs> we speak that. beer. We speak the language we of beer. beer. I remember <laughs> when I was in Bratislava the one time as well. It's like I couldn't speak Slovak and he couldn't speak English, but we spoke beer. Um, so I think that's the language that we speak when you when you get together. But but continue about Spain. Yeah, Spain. Spain, uh, and I totally agree with that. We somehow managed to communicate over food and drink uh, and punk rock. But uh, Catalonia is another amazing place. So I like going to uh, Spain as a whole and, and, and the three different countries, but I've got a real strong affinity both for the Catalans and the Basque people because of the experiences that I've had there and had a great opportunity to, um, to work not only with uh, some of the brewers in the country, uh, but also some of the musicians and some of the, the, you know, the greatest experiences that I've had have been been collaborating with some of the Spanish people and, and the Catalonian uh, beer scene is, is unbelievable. Going back to sour beers again, you've got Aguillon, who is this incredibly small producer, but uh, Carlos, he's, he's an amazing guy. Also, he doesn't speak a word of, of English, but somehow we managed to communicate great. He makes some unbelievable sour beers and also some great real ales. Um, worked a lot with a brewery called uh, Ganeo. They do just great modern beers. One of the, they were one of the finest uh, and earlier uh, Spanish uh, micros that were there. I've done collabs, uh, I'm trying to think who else we worked with in Spain. Uh, Domus, uh, which is in Toledo outside of Madrid, a beautiful city and wonderful, wonderful people there. We've done collabs um, at his brewery and also at mine, uh, which was a three-way collab with Fuller's. It was a lot of fun. Uh, who else have I brewed with out in Spain? Uh, yeah, there's one or two others that's escaping me at the minute. But yeah, I would encourage, it's a, it's a great place to go visit. You can have an awesome, one of the best beer cities in the world is Barcelona. If you're gonna go somewhere, the, the, the beer bars there are phenomenal. The food there is great, the weather is great. People are a blast. So it's definitely a good place to go. Brilliant. Okay, right. So uh, what we're going to get on to next, your top tips for brewing a great winter warmer. I mean, we are going into the cooler months now. I'm not going to say colder because we don't get snow and things like that. Um, especially on the high felt, you know, we get to have uh, nice warm days, cool evenings. But uh, tips for your brewing a great winter warmer. And then after that, we can look into a little bit slightly off the topic, but Star Wars and punk rock. Okay. Uh, so winter warmer, I love, I love winter warmer as a style. We just released, not just, but last winter we did a beer. We just literally called it winter warmer because you couldn't find, you can't find them in the UK anymore. I mean, literally they stop. Um, the last really good one that I remembered was brewed by Young's Brewery who were sold years ago. Um, they used to make a lovely one. So I wanted something along those lines. So top tips for doing that. You have to have, in my opinion, at least uh, a nice estuary yeast. So go for, uh, I'm trying to remember which, we, we use White Labs generally um, as our yeast supplier now. Uh, we do a little bit with Lallemand, but uh, and then grow stuff up from there. But, uh, but look at some of the White Lab strains and find ones that are, not very attenuative uh, and high in uh, high in ester production. And I think that that basically, you wanna have more body in that beer. You don't want it to dry out too much. So definitely not a style for like Cal Ale or anything. Uh, and then obviously what you wanna do is you wanna build some color into it and some warmth and some, some body and some sweetness. So lean to probably a greater extent than that you might be used to you know on some crystal malts depends how complex you want to make it of course you can get lots of different colors of crystal these days so i like to layer things in 
so that you get a really broad mouthfeel. Um, or you can, if you just have access to one type of crystal, that's okay as well. You can, you can kind of go with that, but do it to taste. One thing you can, you can overdo crystal. So try and get the, uh, the balance right on that. But, uh, but the yeast is, is a critical component and on your water treatment side as well. Remember, this is not a beer that's accentuating hops. So if you're doing any burtonizing of the water, uh, you might not need to do quite as much of it because you want a bit of a fuller body. You want a bit more chloride as opposed to the sulfate. So just a quick one as well. Um, which, what yeasts do you use? You said you got a yeast propagator. First of all, what yeast do you use? Um, do you grow up your own yeast strains? And then also just finally, um, one of the guys is curious if Merbeer purge CO2 into their casks um, just a little bit before filling or during filling. Okay, so yeast, uh, like I was saying, for our, well, our main, if I was to look at our, like our house yeast is, is basically 001. So we'll use that, uh, sorry, White Labs 001 Calil yeast. We'll use that for the majority of the beers that we brew because our beers tend to be a little bit more kind of California inspired in their dryness and their cleanness. We're really blessed in Britain with having what I would consider the best and richest uh, malt available to, to brew with. British malt is just absolutely phenomenal because it's a great uh, base to build a beer on. That's, that's another thing that makes us different, I think. And a lot of the modern breweries are focusing so much on the hops. And we do, we use a lot of hops, so don't get me wrong. Uh, but I think if you were just going to drink hop juice, then that to me gets kind of a bit boring. So to me, beer has four main ingredients. I mean, you can flavor it with different things, but we do a different liquor treatment to, we don't have an RO system, by the way, the water in Bristol is pretty shit. So we have to uh, be careful. And we, we do a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of liquor treatment with various salts, but, uh, or acid malt if we need to uh, for the loggers. But uh, you, gotta, you gotta have the right water profile. So like I was saying, for the winter warmer, you know, I mentioned water, you got to get the chloride levels right on that to boost the sweetness and the mouthfeel. You know, that's important. For me, malt is important. Uh, it's, there has to be a base ultimately to build on. And then hops, hops are the spice and the seasoning and, and I like my food highly flavored. So we use a lot of hops for that. And then the yeast has got to be there. So we use 001 as our main yeast. So that way we can get the full flavor that we want out of the malt and the hops. Uh, we want the yeast to take the back seat for that. We do wheat beers where we'll, we'll of course use um, more sort of German inspired uh, yeast for that. Uh, for our, if we're looking for something like the winter warmer or for our old ale, we'll use uh, uh, British, more, more ester producing uh, yeast for that, lower attenuative. We've done Saison's, uh, we do for lagers, we use proper lager yeast, the same one that everyone uses. Um, the nice thing about being able to, to grow our own yeast up is that we can access, literally we can get like a homebrew vial and just grow it up to commercial capacity if we want to. That's basically how we do it. Uh, so that was the yeast question. I forgot the other question. Um, will we just slightly off? Oh, the cask, CO2, CO2. Uh, curious if we'll be a purge CO2 into the casks when filling. Uh, we don't, no. Uh, I've always been of the opinion that yeast will scrub in, uh, which obviously it does. Uh, interestingly, with our cans, we noticed that um, th there's no, there's, there's categorically no way to deny that can is a better package for liquid than a bottle is. So it doesn't let in any light and it doesn't let in any air. So where bottle caps do have some oxygen transfer. And of course there's light strike that can happen in the beer, even in, in brown bottles. So originally when we had our bottling line, we were gonna do bottles and cans side by side. And as soon as I tasted the first can off the line, I said, no way. And we literally, we just stopped bottling and that was it. So if you have to invest in technology and also where the market is going, I would say cans thousand, a thousand percent. One thing that is true is they have a larger aperture and they are when you are filling them, there could be potential for oxidation. And even if you have yeast in there, we did notice some color difference between our keg beer and our can beer initially. 
um, until so we made some additional CO2 injections along the canning line to try and purge that out more. Uh, but we don't do that with our cask beer, which is I've never really thought of it that way before. Um, yeah, I mean, I've never heard of anyone CO2 purging a cask. Now that you mention it, for something like an IPA, it might not be a bad idea. It depends what you're trying to do. But when you look at cask beer and the way that it's dispensed and typically the styles of beer that you'd want to drink in cask, because let's be honest, not all styles are good in cask. Like wheat beer, no one wants a cellular temperature, low carbonated wheat beer. It would just be cloying and heavy and insipid yes, and unpleasant. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting question, but no, we don't do it. And no one's actually... Whilst we noticed oxidation problems in our cans for the first couple of years until we made the changes to the line, uh, I can't say that we ever have thought about it in relation to cask. Thank you, lost you, Julian. Oh, there you go. That's weird. Okay. We're just getting a. There we go. There we go. I think we're back again. Yeah. We're just... Hello. That's weird. Yes. Anyway, so yeah, cans. Cans. Are, I mean, we we moved from nothing. Well, we moved from bottles. We stopped bottling completely um, about two years ago, and then we just recently also invested in the canning line. And the first thing that it does is it purges CO two to get all the oxygen out obviously so the do is obviously way way low on the lines and things like that but let's get on to the topic of star wars and punk rock before we close out on the session <laughs> <laughs> no problem. yeah so as i said this brewery was basically um just a lifestyle passion of mine initially and then as we've grown as a company we have uh, you know, over 20 full-time employees and then some, some part-time people who help out on the tap now and again. Uh, we never really intended this to become what it was, but it is kind of inevitable. And that's perhaps a, a good lesson learned as well is, uh, you know, you, it's, it would be a, nice to sort of figure out what you want in the end goal with it. So initially when I started the brewery, it was all about, I will brew every single batch of beer. And uh, if it's not got my hand on it, it's not gonna go out the door. The reality now is I've got an absolutely phenomenal brewery manager, uh, Tom Scratcher, who's been with me for 10 years now. Uh, when he joined, he had never even home brewed before. Uh, I knew him from uh, my favorite pub where his uh, his brother is now my, my retail manager, so we've got a great family relationship there, and he does a great job. He basically runs the brewery every day, so I have not physically, like, I don't physically brew the beer anymore, but we do every single recipe together, uh, any troubleshooting, any strategy, any new equipment we want to put in. That's kind of like a head brewer's role in, in a bigger growing brewery, so I would say for those of you who are out there, think about where you're going and what you want to do, because ultimately, you will probably, if you're successful, you'll probably grow to the point where you're going to wind up sitting on email and talking to banks and going out and <laughs> doing the, the businessy stuff more than the brewing stuff. That's a reality. But to bring the fun back into it, the things, the other passions that I've got are basically punk rock and Star Wars. So we incorporate those really as much as we can into the beer just because we just do what I want. Uh, so whenever there's a new Star Wars film, we always bring out uh, new beer for it. The last one we did was for, for episode nine. So we brewed a 9% uh, red, red uh, IPA called Jet IPA. Uh, we've done lots of, lots of other Star Wars related beers. And in fact, next Monday, we're going to be doing a tasting for Star Wars Day for May the 4th. Um, it's just a, it's a creative outlet for me. It's something that, that I get to do. And it's, it's a lot of fun. And from the punk rock side, I can get a lot more involved because Lucasfilm doesn't want to know about beer and certainly any royalty rights would uh, would not be anything we could afford but punk rock is very diy so that's another thing that's growing up in the scene with that so i've been able to work with uh, some of my favorite bands been able to 
go out and raise money through uh, through a charity called Hardcore Hits Cancer, which is fantastic. So we brew a beer called PMA. Uh, for those who don't know, PMA stands for Positive Mental Attitude. It's a great, originally inspired from a book, but from a great Bad Brains um, song called Attitude. And I was in, actually, I was in Catalonia. I was at a, uh, a concert from a Basque band who were singing all in Basque. So someone said, we have to go to this. You're going to love the concert. You won't understand a word they said, but we're going to go. So I went with like zero expectation and it was absolutely blown away. It was like, literally, it was life changing. It's another one of my tattoos now. Uh, and the lead singer and guitarist was wearing a shirt that said, uh, hardcore hits cancer. So of course, loving hardcore punk and, and being, uh, touched like everyone else has in, in different ways with unfortunately with you know people that we know who've had cancer wanted to raise some money for that so we started working together we wound up uh, brewing a beer for the band and we also raise money this way for it so it's you know one of the great things about this community is you can bring your personal expression to it no one really wants a cookie cutter version of you know an American pale ale if you're going to do something then make it yours, have some pride in it, have some fun with it. Whatever makes you tick, if you like, um, I don't know, if you like watercolor painting or what, you know, do whatever you want that's gonna make your brewery yours. We're very much known for doing Star Wars, for doing punk rock, for just basically having a bit of a DIY attitude. And consequently, those are the kind of people that typically wanna hang out with us and drink our beer and we have a lot of fun and hopefully we make enough money to survive the crap that we're in right now. <laughs> 100%. No, that's awesome. You know, that is really, really good. You know, as you said, uh, make your beer your own. Keep it original. And I think that's a big thing that some of the um, other breweries, they, they're trying to be somebody else. Be your own. Make your own beer. And obviously, um, we were a big um, push for that as well. So listen here. Uh, Yes, you know, everybody wants to try and copy the brew dog. Don't be brew dog. They've got all that's brew dog's brew dog, you know. But uh, be yourself, make your beer, and people will come for that beer. And we've started noticing that ourselves in our new brew pub. We've only been open for, well, we can't even celebrate our first birthday because we're closed at the moment. Um, but we noticed that now that. Um, that our Cray Cray RPA has become the top seller. It was brewed with seven different types of hops. It's completely cray cray, but it's our own. We designed it, uh, or Wendy designed it, and um, we brewed it, and it is really, really fantastic. So may the 4th be with you. Um, looking with forward you. to that. <laughs> <laughs> and we, and we ho hope to be back on that time uh, side of the world sometime soon again. I'd love to visit the vaults, taste some of the new beers and everything. Justin, thank you so much for joining us and giving us the insight on more beer and uh, we wish you and your partner all the best uh, for the future and of course more beer um strength and strength no no thanks a lot for having me it's been a great time i can't wait to get down to south africa and really to try the hops because i've heard amazing things about the hops being grown and you just literally we cannot get them here so i really want to try them so now cheers to all you guys for uh, for putting up with me and have a great time. Good luck surviving the lockdown. Yeah, hundred we'll percent. I'm, sure, I'm sure your 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 back's going to be good in uh, twelve months from now. So uh, we definitely won't write that off. And I look forward to to doing a collaboration beer here in South Africa at our brew pub sometime soon. Absolutely, sounds great. Now you guys take, take care. Cheers. You too. All the best. Take you. All the best. Cheers.